I would like to start on time. Um, good to see you all here. Uh, I would like to introduce Professor Klaus Fiebeck, who joins us from the University of Vienna, although not today. He has done a tour of the United States and uh, uh, we are one of his stops. Um, Professor Fiebeck, specializes, of course, in German idealism, skepticism, and the foundations of the, a philosophy of freedom. And his research centers around the actuality of the philosophy of Hegel as a thinker of freedom. Uh, he has made many, many contributions to this general overall topic. Um, in particular, he has contributed with many publications to a comprehensive interpretation of Hegel's outlines of the philosophy of right. Uh, and the latest uh, publication is a 800 pages <laughs> biography of Hegel, which is already in its third edition, I think, although it's only two years old uh, and has already been translated in a number of languages. Uh, he is currently working on outlines for a new understanding of the history of philosophy. He has taught and researched in universities all over the globe. Uh, University of Washington, among other places, but Tübingen, Heidelberg, Erlangen, the Hegel archives in Bochum, that's only for Germany, and then the University of Prague in uh, Italy, in many universities, Pisa, Siena, Naples, Rome, and so on. In Vienna, at the University of Vienna, in Australia, Mexico, Colombia, and Japan. And finally, at Fudan University, from which we have had more than one uh, visiting scholar in the past, at least, and at the East China University in Shanghai. Um, his monographs are too many to mention, so I will just make a, a selection. Um, many years ago, he wrote a monograph on the, I'm translating in English the title here, on the Jan Hegel and the ghost of skepticism. Uh, he then published on uh, skepticism and freedom. Um, then the logic of freedom. Uh, also a monograph on Hegel's philosophy of art, which, however, exists at the moment only in Chinese. So good luck if you want to look into it. <laughs> um, but he's planning to do it in a European language, one or the other, that we can access eventually. Uh, then um, uh, the idealism or, of freedom for a Hegelian turn in philosophy. That's an English title. Uh, of a book of 2020. Uh, and um, I think the Hegel, the philosophy of freedom is the title of the biography, right? Yeah. Um, he has edited many uh, books as well on Kant and German idealism, on Hegel's logic and modernity. Uh, the West Eastern Mirror Virtue and Morality in the Chinese-German Dialogue, and finally also Hegel and Italy, Italy and Hegel. Today he will be speaking to us about a very old, but also very Hegelian topic, namely where to begin a systematic philosophy, a philosophy in, understood as science. The title of his, uh, um, paper is Hegel's Adventures in Wonderland or the Beginning of Philosophy. Please welcome Klaus Fiebeck. Thank you.
Thank you very much for the friendly invitation and the friendly words to Professor De Laurenti is. I'm here for the second time, maybe six years ago, mm -hmm. I was here. And at first, uh, excuse me for my bad English for the discussion. I need a little help. Uh, a very short preface, not to my topic, but Hegel and New York. In the 19th century, August Röbling, a hero of Hegel's lectures from my native state Thuringia, whom Hegel hold in the highest esteem, built, maybe you know, the Brooklyn Bridge one of the most famous buildings of the modern era. Anyhow, the builder of the Brooklyn Bridge, as he traveled to New York, had a copy of Hegel's Encyclopedia in his luggage. This book is now in the Röbling collection at the Rensselaer Polytech Polytechnic Institute in New York. As a student, Röbling, took speak courses in modern languages at the University of Berlin and attended assiduously the lectures of the world famous philosopher Hegel. It is a tradition of the family, so the son Röbling, that Röbling was Hegel's favorite pupil and this receives confirmation in the fact that he seems to have absorbed the spirit of Hegelian philosophy and all through his latter life spoke with pride of his association with the master. Röbling's son write again, the profound sympathy with which my father in his laser hours pursued the study of metaphysics and the higher, edu uh, the higher branches of mental philosophy, I have attributed to his intimate relations with Hegel whose favorite pupil he was. Hegel occupied at that time the chair of philosophy at the Berlin University. And he was the deepest thinker of his day. So the son of the architect of the Brooklyn Bridge. Now to my topic, Hegel's adventures in Wonderland or the beginning of philosophy. Where shall I begin, please? Asked the white rabbit. Beginning at the beginning, the king said gravely. The king's answer in Lewis Carroll's Alice Adventures in Wonderland recalls the answer given by the sovereign of modern philosophy under the heading, with what must the science begin? Hegel's philosophical magic trick is to pull the white rabbit of the beginning out of the head of wisdom. As it well known, the question of the beginning in Hegel's philosophy is one of the most controversial points in Hegel's scholarship. 100, 100 different Hegel researchers will give you a hundred different, sometimes contradictory answers. What follows is my attempt at an interpretation better. What follows represent the building blocks of an interpretation. With this passage of the science of logic, uh, is it clear what Hegel intended with the paradoxical dictum of a third philosophy? that would be neither dogmatism nor skepticism, neither realism nor constructivism, but both. He offers a way out of the fixation on the beginning. Where philosophy's starting point to be something determinate, something mediated, it, was, it would disqualify itself as a beginning, for it would presuppose something that justifies it, and so would fall into the inclu inconclusive regress 
of relativity. Where, where the beginning to be the indeterminate, the unfounded, the immediate, it would amount to a dogmatism of pure assertion. As the beginning Hegel, relying on arguments he had already developed in Jena, decisively, decisively turns against such arbitrary postulations of the beginning, a shot from the gun of inner revelation of faith or intellectual intuition, turns, turns against Jacobi and Shelley, who ignored from the outset the method of logic and, and thus abandoned hope of knowledge. By contrast, Fichte, so Hegel quote, Fichte's more consistent transcendental idealism is prized for letting reason itself represent its determinations. In the introduction, the elements of the superseded oppositions of consciousness are emphasized again three times and Hegel's beginning with pure knowledge, the pure concept is seen to be no provisional assumption of or mere assertion that is said to have received its justification, its proof in the procedure of the phenomenology of spirit. The second edition of the logic of 1831 confirms that the Jena phenomenology of spirit provides the deduction, the deduction of the concept of pure science, of the beginning of philosophy as such, and thus also of the beginning of logic. However, with the logic, the lethos of accomplished skepticism assented in the phenomenology can be set aside. It seems that the logical beginning can thus be taken in two ways, in a mediated or an immediate way. Early on the section with what must the science begin, Hegel emphasizes these two paths. Drawing, drawing upon the encyclopedia, Hegel highlights that, quote, there is nothing, nothing in heaven or in nature or in mind or anywhere else, which does not equally contain both immediacy and mediation. So that these, these two determinations reveal themselves to be unseparated and inseparable and the opposition between them to be a nullity." End of the quote. To this extent, Hegel, literally like Odysseus, attempts to escape a di dilemma. The ancient hero managed to escape the monstrous dilemma of Scylla and Charybdis, harking uh, lurking uh, on both sides of the Strait of Messina. The question of beginning in Hegel's logic recalls in many ways Odysseus, Odysseus enterprise. Knowledge is to avoid falling victim to both. The all-consuming pull of the Scylla called immediacy and the varices, the entangles of the Charybdis mediation. Two equally great evils are to be avoided. The route between them is narrow and treacherous. Mediation or immediacy. In paragraph 12 of the encyclopedia we read, when both moments, immediacy and mediation, quote, present themselves as distinct, still neither of them can be absent, nor 
can one exist apart from the other, end of the quote. Paragraph 65 of the encyclopedia argues against an either or of immediate versus mediated knowledge. According to Hegel, it depends on the logic of the opposition of immediacy and mediation. Quote, Hegel, the whole of the second part of logic, the doctrine of essence, is a discussion, now it's uh, very important, is a discussion of the intrinsic and self-affirming unity of immediacy and mediation. End of the quote. Here, too, the question of the beginning cannot contravene the basic principles of the method Hegel has outlined, cannot go against the internal structure of the concept, self-relating negativity. Consequently, the possibility of an either or is excluded. One can begin neither with the mere immediacy nor mere mediation. Even if both moments appear to be distinct, appear, they must be understood as inseparably connected. Thus, the author provides two variations, uh, maybe two perspectives on the one beginning, two logical paths, which are two moments in their respective one-sidedness, which at the same time contain their own sublation which contain negativity within themselves and which thus establish the identity or the unity of immediacy and mediation. In variation A, the first, the mediation version, the result of the phenomenology figures as the logical beginning a beginning mediated by the proof contained therein of the standpoint of pure knowledge or of comprehending thinking. All other, that's, it's very important, all other possible starting points are excluded. Opinions, feelings, beliefs, etc., ideas, etc. In this respect, the phenomenology is a presupposition of the logic. It legitimates the beginning by means of the negation of the paradigm of consciousness, by means of the skeptical side as sublation of relativity, of mediation in pure comprehending thinking. Thus, the result immediately reverts to the beginning, the end to the start. The consequence of the path of mediation was the sublation of mediation. Pure comprehending knowledge as simple immediacy without any further determination. Mediation involves the sublation of itself, the purely immediate. This was the first variation, variation A. In variation B, the second, the immediacy version, the beginning is to be taken immediately by means of the decision to want to think purely. It's a Hegel quote. The decision to want to think purely, to think thinking as such, like Aristotle. Think, thinking. This deciding, in German, entschließen, literally declosing, means opening, implies immediate positing the ease of incipient thinking, the ease, nothing else. 
Indeed, there can be no talk of existence before the existence in before uh, the decision. Hegel suggests that, quote, what constitutes the beginning and the beginning itself are synonymous, end of the quote. The pure being as the first immediacy is posited, pronounced. Here, nothing is presupposed. No mediation is called upon. However, pure being is, and this existence is a determination. The absolutely immediate proves to be just as absolutely mediated. Through the necessary progress of deduction, the beginning loses what it represents in this first determination, namely to be something in, indeterminate and abstract as such. Even pure knowledge is negative determination, has negativity in itself, thus has the minimal determination of being indefinite. Both, both roads lead to the goal. In German, we say both roads lead to Rome. To pure being as a determination that must first emerge in knowledge, the immediate, the simple, that which is not yet determined, is mere beginning. With this, declares, Hegel declares the argument to be concluded. What remains is mere explication and illustration. The legitimation of the beginning combines so one-sided mediatedness with equally one-sided immediacy, combines presupposition and presupposition less. Both variants lead to the pure is, to pure being. Strictly speaking, Hegel's logic begins with pure comprehending thinking, and the pure is, pure being, and the pure is of the thinking posited thereby. The logic contains nothing but purely self-comprehending thinking, nothing more. It starts with this thinking in the form of being. To take an example, whoever decides and schließt in German to play chess, I made this on, on Sunday at Washington Square in New York to play chess. Uh, whoever opens themselves up to the game manifests their decision to play chess through their opening move, the first move, which, however, involves chess thinking as a precondition and must comply with the game's principle, its rules. Being, pure being, articulates the minimum definition of the concept. With this first being, immediacy, the in itself defines itself as indefinite, without any further determination. This is a very important the word further, simply as equality with itself. In German, when one says without any further determination, it implies that at least one determination is given, while further determinations are excluded. Hegel insists on this minimum with his use of the superlative. Being is the very poorest, the most abstract determination. 
for thought, there can be nothing less in terms of content than pure being. It is the least that can be pointed to in the concept, or in Hegel's world, the most meager, most abstract initial determination of all. Here we see precisely the seeming paradox of indeterminacy and determinacy, or the determinacy of indeterminacy. This beginning as beginning in its radical simplicity, its simple determination of being can only be empty determination. The phenomenology had likewise begun with the most immediate, poorest, most abstract figure whose poverty was its only asset and was itself destined to disappear. The simple consciousness of what is and what is meant. The logical beginning can be described as the initial unity of the universal, the particular and the individual or singular, in which these moments are not yet distinguished by their unfolding though still underdetermined or underdefined, they are already in play. Equality as the most abstract universality, abstract difference as indeterminate particular and singularity as underdetermined individuality. This extreme deficiency demands a corresponding linguistic expression, but there can be no proposition, no judgment here, only the simple word being, an exclamation, exclamatio in Latin, the transformation of a sentence into an exclamation. Here, an isolated word, the minimalistic linguistic prototypes of the concept. The beginning thus emerges as that which is deficient in itself, the deficit par excellence. The simple beginning in Hegel, the, uh, Hegel's word is posited as afflicted with a negation. The Scandi's most meager definition of negativity pure negativity or nothingness. Such a first step, such a departure still remains immediate in so far as being is posited here immediately. The nothing emerges in it only immediately, so Hegel. The superlative is unable to es escape the determinacy, the mediation, the relation that is imminent to it. The logical second step, the second issue, the negative proves to be an original first affliction. Pure being is posited as afflicted with negation, with nothingness is likewise, while nothingness is likewise pure equality with itself. In linguistic terms, it is like saying being nothing, two opposing mutually exclusive words in one, an oxymoron, something wittily stupid, something unspeakably sayable, so Goethe, unspeakable, unspeakably sayable. In Hegel's version, being and nothing are the same, absolutely identical, the minimum of unity or identity. Yet there is a wholly abstract difference between the first word or issue being 
in the second world or issue nothing. Thus, the minimal form of distinction, the primal form of non-identity or difference and contradiction is articulated. The logical first and the logical second, nothing more. Each carries negation in itself and so disappears immediately into its opposite, the first abstract minimal movement as an initial logical movement, what Hegel calls abstract becoming. Thus, the beginning necessarily involves the unity of being and nothing in becoming and its negation, in which being and nothing first make themselves presents as moments, now only as moments. This Hegel's characterizes as the first truth, which now underlies all further things qua reflexive neg negativity. Being and nothing are prototypes of their own other. Their radically underdetermined logical formation, uh, their radically underdetermined logical formation. Negativity relating to itself proves to be a basic constitution of logic or the germ cell of the free concept itself. This is illustrated in the sections of the logic headed remarks in which Hegel discusses key moments in the history of philosophy, but in logical rather than temporal historical sequence. Firstly, Terminides being, secondly, the nothingness of Buddhism, and thirdly, uh, the profound Heraclitus, who had sublated the simple and one-sided abstractions of being and nothingness in a higher realm becoming, but had done so in minimal abstract form, everything as becoming. In addition, the order adds examples, Hegel, uh, examples of blatant vagueness misinterpretations of the language of being and nothing, which treat is which treat it as the same thing. Being and nothingness must be taken very strictly in this radical extreme abstraction mentioned as abstract things of thought, not as any more specific, anything more specific. The assumption that there is anything more determinate to them is absurd and nonsensical. It would see equivalence in whether this house exists or doesn't, whether $100 belongs to me or not. With this first minimalistic unity of op opposites, the cornerstone is light for the concept. The foundation for the imminent movement of the further determination of thought for the self-constructing path to knowledge. As the science of logic progresses, the theoretical understanding of its beginning, so uh, Anton Koch, a quote, will gradually expand. In the beginning, we know only very superficially what we are doing. We understand only as much as is necessary to begin and then to proceed in an orderly way, so called. In this way, it is possible to avoid illegitimate presuppositions and dogmatic intrusions by uniting presupposition, presupposition and presupposition less. However, the next steps must show, especially in their transition, logical stringency another unavoidable challenge to the new logic of the concept. 
I come to an example for the idea of beginning in Hegel. Among the most convincing passages of Hegel's philosophy uh, in uh, the Hegel's philosophy of right are the paragraphs five to seven, in which the logical anchoring of the philosophical theory of free will and action of Hegel's practical philosophy is subtly demonstrated. Here, one finds, in addition, a clear exposition of the relation between immediacy and mediation. That is essential for Hegel's philosophizing at large. The fundamental definition of the concept of free will as the principle and beginning of the science of right can only be meaningfully and wholly understood by referring back to Hegel's innovative logic. The, you know the fundamental triad of the determination, universality, particularity, and individuality. The starting point, you, uh, the universal concept, results from the end point of subjective spirit, the I the self as the first form of truly free will, the immediate individuality posited by itself, elevated to universality. The immediacy of the I emerging from the total renunciation of any particular content is categorically st stated in paragraph five. The free will as self-thinking itself, the I as pure thinking of oneself. Both the philosophy of right and the logic present this first moment of the will as a thinking I or, or self in almost identical ways. I, the self, is, quote, first, the pure self-related unity, and it is so not immediately, but only as making abstraction from all determinateness and content, and withdrawing into the freedom of unrestricted equality with itself. As such is it, it is universality, end of the quote. The indeterminacy, the abstract identity is the sole determinacy, the one that is found in the determinacy of identity. In this pure thinking, I want myself to be universal and to exclude all particularity. I want to have all determinations as possibility within me. But this first moment is itself, quote, not without determinacy and to be something this is the main point and to be something abstract and one-sided constitutes its determinacy end of the quote the concept of the will is still underdetermined so here we should remember the quotation from the logic without any further determination but it is by no means completely indeterminate or purely immediate. Rather, it has precisely the minimum of one determination, only one. Here, we should pause, for we have here nothing less than the fundamental argument of Hegelian logic and the guiding idea of his practical philosophy, the fulcrum of Hegelian philosophizing, immediacy and mediation, universality and particularity, contains their other in themselves. We thus have the germ of a contradiction which is to be sublated. Only in this way does the door open to a logical transition from universality as indeterminacy, supposed, to particularity, primarily 
it is a question quote of this absolute possibility of abstraction from every determination in which i may find myself or which i may have set up in myself end of the quote the i the self emerges as potential agent as author as unconditional and un undetermined determined initiator yet this first moment lacks the dimension of efficacy it remains in the supposedly purely theoretical realm freedom thus remains only absolute possibility in this first step of thinking for the will its opposites paradoxically emerges emotionless unwanted and inactive thing this negative theoretical aspect of freedom remains a necessary but in uh, but in inadequate definitions of freedom paragraph six deals with the moment of free will its particularity the i because of the essential one-sidedness of the first moment the domination must simultaneously be thought of as the abandoning of indeterminacy as the unlocking of closeness like in the logic as opening differentiating primordial dividing in german urteilen or urteil and in english judgment as the positing of the determinacy of a content or an object the will emerges in a logically necessary way from its universality into its particularity essential attributes of the particular such as attribution responsibility authorship rest on this theorem by performing this determining and schließen like in the logic the ego the i can be described as an actor as an acting i by positing itself as a particular determining as unlocking the i becomes existence it becomes finitude the specificity of the i is thereby articulated quote the, through this positing of itself as something determinate the i steps into determinate existence in general end of the quote this is the absolute moment of the finitude of the i the second moment is already contained in the first it is as the key passage says quote only something determinate one-sided being abstraction from all determinacy it is itself not without determinacy and to be something abstract quoted and to be something abstract and one-sided constitutes its determinacy its defectiveness and its finitude end of the quote this moment b is not simply added in the sense of an also of an addition the negative is not just a supplementary second step but is inherent in the first immanent negativity as the core of he hegelian logic must be conceived in terms here of free will the first moment already implies what it excludes it is not pure to true infinity and universality not the complete concept but in its status as indeterminate and abstract we find precisely its determinacy the i can indeed abstract from everything but not from thinking because abstraction is itself thinking thus 
it is not without determination, not empty, not eternal indecision, but rather its indeterminacy constitutes its determinacy. Pure abstraction has the, like in the logic, the determinacy of indeterminacy, suppose indeterminacy must be considered as determinacy. The path to the ground is revealed in paragraph seven, the logical unity of both moments, like in the logic being and nothing. In individuality or singularity, immediacy and mediation of knowledge are both one-sided abstractions, one like the other. Through speculative thinking in Hegel's sense, comprehension does not exclude one or the other, but unites both in itself. In individuality or singularity, the two conceptual determinations have their ground in that each are only moments which are joined together. The primordial division in German Urteilung becomes a concluding, einen Zusammenschluss. The logical form of judgment passes into the logical form of conclusion, of inference, or better, in the syllogism. Hegel regards the individual as particularity reflected in itself and thus return to the universal, the negativity of negativity, the true self-determination of the I, which determines itself so that it is particular, but remains identical with itself and joins itself only with itself. Hegel's understanding of self-determination is based on, that, on this. The I, quote, determines in itself in so far as it is the relating of neg negativity to itself, end of the quote. And at this relating, the I is simultaneously indifferent to this determination. The I is determined, but remains just as indifferent to this determination. Knows it is, knows it as its own, as pure possibility. A being that is able to distinguish itself in this way from the specific nature of its existence can be regarded as free being or as a rational being. Hegel emphasized once again, the moments A and B are easily conceded, but not the moment C, the third moment. This is in Hegel's eyes, the speculative and true, the individual, the singular, the concept par excellence. The concept is the universal, which on the one hand negates itself by its own activity into particularizations and determinacy, but on the other hand, once again sublates this particularity, which is the negative of the universal. For the universal does not meet in the particular with something absolutely other. The particulars are only particular aspects of the universal itself. And therefore the universal restores in the particular its unity with itself as universal. In returning into itself, the concept as infinite negativity, not a negation of something other than itself, but self-determination in which it remains purely and simply a self-relating affirmative unity. Thus is true uni individuality as universality closing only with itself in its particularizations. So Hegel. 
the will as self-determination of the I in which the individual must be thought of as, uh, as the unity of the universal and the particular can only be grasped by speculative thinking. The proof of the core idea, so Hegel, of self-relating negativity that we owe to the science of logic. The concept of willing in the form of an individual is regarded by Hegel as the absolute principle of the philosophy of right, and at the same time as the pivot of the modern world. Quote, the absolute principle, the moment of our times, end of the quote. The concept of free will may thus be understood as absolute, but by no means as something transcendent, nor as something really, uh, untouchable. It is a freedom alone that constitutes the content of the concept of will. The decisive thing is that the I, quote, in its limitation with other is with itself that by determining itself is it nevertheless abides with itself and does not cease to abide with itself. End of the quote. A short conclusion. After these reflections on the beginning, a very brief conclusion is in order. Hegel clearly insists on the unity of the opposition, immediacy versus mediation, which in the form of the logical conclusion presupposed each other. Each are isolated one-sided abstractions. The crown of mediation is at the same time the crown from which the immediate emerges and vice versa, the crown of immediacy. This is proved in the ancient skeptical tropes of Sextus Empiricus, is the crown from which mediation emerges. Thinking according to Hegel, is the mediation and sublation of mediation, just as it is the immediacy and sublation of the immediate. The inseparability of the opposing determinations must be thought together in their totality. This also applies to the beginning. No exception is possible. A comprehensive substantiation of this argumentation would still have to be worked on in detail. Here I have merely introduced the reader, the hero, to, this, to the issue in question. And the king in Lewis Carroll's novel, Alice Adventures in Wonderland, then ordered, the king then ordered, read to the end and then stop. That's exactly what I'm going to do now. Stop talking about the beginning. Thank you.
can I still not think of myself as something non-thinking? I'm thinking. What about abstracting from thinking? I don't know, I'm not sure the extent to which that makes much sense, but as a question. But isn't it possible for me to think of myself as, as a non-thinking being, as a non-thinking agent, um, insofar as I do that, then I am not abstracting from thinking when I attempt to think that. And I'm just curious to, to think of how Hegel would respond to that line of, well, thinking. <laughs> Is that enough to go? <laughs> yes. Um, uh, at first, maybe in German, uh, uh, Descartes is natürlich hier im Spiel, aber das ist das ist jetzt der, Be der Anfang der praktischen Philosophie. Also wir müssen jetzt aufpassen, ich habe ein Beispiel gebracht, ja. wo eben ein Anfangsdenken bei Hegel wieder auftaucht. Das ist, Let ja. me translate that. Sorry. Um, yes, the, the answer is yes, of course, Descartes is in the background of all this, but what uh, uh, Klaus just did was to uh, emphasize the beginning of Hegel's, I guess, practical yeah, thinking. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I realize that. Oh. Um, and that's also, uh, well, a good Cartesian and willing is the mode of thinking. Yeah. So okay. that's yeah. my reference to the Cartesian rabbit may be badly placed, but uh, uh. still. I'd like to pose the question and see where that might lead. How that can be responded to from the standpoint of, well, the uh, concept of will the, of a thinking being. Uh, the zweite Teil der Antwort wäre, uh, wenn jemand sich als ein nicht denkendes Wesen versteht, mm -hmm dann äh, denkt er, dann ist das ein Irrtum und mehr nicht. Missversteht. Ja, er versteht sich miss, er äh, täuscht sich selbst. Diese Strukturen okay. werden in der Phänomenologie des Geistes übrigen schon vorgeführt. Die yeah. Selbsttäuschung, äh, äh, also das Missverstehen mhm. von mir selbst äh, ist auch ein Verstehen, ist auch ein Denken. Mhm. Aus diesem äh, Problem komme ich nicht heraus. Auch wenn ich meine, ich bin ein nicht denkendes Wesen. So the answer to Jeff's first uh, comment is that, of course, uh, as um, illustrated uh, repeatedly in the phenomenology of spirit, which was the introduction or induction into uh, the uh, philosophy and the logic, um, as demonstrated there, uh, even if a being were to think of itself as non-thinking, it would be a misunderstanding of itself on the part of this thinking being. So if you think yeah. that you are a non-thinking being, you are already in a uh, Typical constellation is those that come up again and again in the phenomenology of spirit, right? Und äh, zu Descartes, für Hegel ist das äh, dieses äh, kathesische Motiv der Beginn der modernen Philosophie. Aber es ist nicht, der, es kann nicht der Beginn der Logik sein, weil es schon äh, im Englisch zu elaborated ist. Ich denke, das ist schon äh, zu viel für, die, äh, für den abstrakten Beginn der Logik. So, yes, Hegel would uh, certainly or does consider the cogito or, or Descartes basic argument as uh, the beginning of modern philosophy. 
but only in a limited sense because the card already gives too much of an elaborate yes. uh, account of the cogito uh, rather than the more abstract one that Hegel claims to be giving in the first chapter of the logic. Yeah. Uh, one and two. Should we start? No, no you go. You go. Um, so my question is, I wonder if you could say more about the image or the figure of the circle that Hegel uses. He says that um, the beginning, that, that science is a circle. And I think he says that, the, he says in that first section that the beginning, is the ground, but he also says that the results or the end is the ground. And so my question is, how can a circle have a ground? Uh, what you know? Yeah, I guess that's the question. How can the circle have a ground? Um, given that it's a circle. Hegel's Verwendung des Kreises oder des Zirkels ist natürlich eine Metapher. Das ist kein Begriff, der, äh, sondern er versucht zu zeigen, äh, dass ich, äh, wenn ich logisch so starte, notwendigerweise strikt wieder zurückkomme zu diesem Punkt. Aber das ist nicht mehr der abstrakte Ausgangspunkt, sondern ich habe die ganze äh, Wissenschaft der Logik durchlaufen. Ich komme zwar wieder dahin, aber äh, es ist also kein mathematischer oder geometrischer Kreis, der durchlaufen wird. So, uh, first of all, um, we should realize that, of course, the image of the circle is a metaphor. And the, um, it is not a concept in the logical sense. And therefore, uh, the metaphor um, suggests or maybe illustrates um, that the way in which the logic begins, this abstract thinking begins by thinking itself, is the end point at which after the entire logic has been gone through, uh, it's the, the point at which thinking returns, but no longer abstract in, in the same abstract way but enriched by all the categories that it has gone through. Man kann es vergleichen, das ist auch eine Met Metapher, vergleichen mit dem Bau eines Doms oder einer großen Kirche. Da wird auch zuerst das Fundament gelegt. Und zum Schluss wird wiederum das Fundament gesetzt, nämlich im Keystone, im Schlussstein. Und der ist entscheidend für die Architektur äh, dieser äh, Kirche oder des Doms, sonst würde sie zusammenstürzen. Das heißt, der Schlussstein ist auch das Fundament, aber nicht identisch mit dem Fundament der Kirche. Another perhaps more useful metaphor than the circle would be that of the construction of a dome. So you first you have, of course, to uh, construct the basis on which to then uh, pile up uh, everything else. But the real ground, if you will, of the dome, that which holds it all together, is going to be the keystone. So the last stone. What? The last. The last, yes, yes. So would, would Hegel say that the, the end or the result is the real Ground. Yes. Yes. And the crown for the uh, next parts of, of philosophy, the philosophy of nature and uh, uh, philosophy of right, etc., philosophy of art. It's the, we'll the ground. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, the, mm. okay. Uh, it's um, no, I'm not a Hegel scholar, so maybe I shouldn't even ask. But you can yeah. ask a question in German to. Uh... Yeah, but then. Okay. I don't care. No, no, that's okay. Uh, you kind of developed these two 
scenarios, the logical, and then the I, the subject, and use the same kind of data model. So negativity in being or difference yeah. in the one and so on. Uh, since you now in the conversation with Chef reiterated the practical philosophy, I simply do not get how the logic model like matches the practical philosophy. That something else? Uh, for Hegel, the, uh, <laughs> for Hegel is the logical background or the logical fundament for, uh, of practical philosophy in the science of logic. I have a quote from Hegel's uh, philosophy of right. Hegel, since I have fully developed the nature of speculative knowledge, in my science of logic, I have only occasionally added an explanatory uh, command on procedure and method in the present outline in the philosophy of right. It will re uh, readily be noticed that the work as a whole, like the construction of its parts, is based on the logical spirit. It is also chiefly this is the main point, from this point of view, view that I would wish this treatise, uh, the philosophy of right, to be understood and judged. This is the logical uh, ground. The, the science of logic is the fundament. That, uh, that's why I, from all parts for, 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 of philosophy, that's why I spoke it's, uh, like it was not exactly uh, an example the practical philosophy, but I try to show uh, you have this structure of mediation and immediacy also at the beginning of the philosophy of right. The fundament is the science of logic. For Hegel, maybe he's wrong. But what's the uh, difference for Hegel between practical philosophy and because in, in, in der Logik wird, äh, wird, der, äh, wird das Verständnis des Begriffs oder der Idee dargestellt. In der praktischen Philosophie geht es um den Begriff oder die Idee des freien Willens und freien Handelns. Und das ist was anderes als die pure Logik. Ja, also äh, das ist ganz kurz, ganz knapp, uh, der Unterschied, the difference between the science of logic and the philosophy of right. So the science of logic essentially provides the uh, grasp, the conception uh, of uh, the I. And the uh, um, practical philosophy provides the conception of the will willing itself if you will okay uh and therefore of the possibility of freedom which includes for, of course for he like for everybody else also the possibility of free action not just free thinking yeah Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I guess I'm left with a really basic question about the phenomenology spirit and sense certainty. Uh, to me, like, really begins with, you know, Hegel's attempt to kind of uh, ground things in, in unarticulated experience, which for him is related to sense and pure being. And I guess from that perspective, why would the beginning of philosophy be a problem for Hegel if that's if that seems to be how the phenomenology of spirit starts? Like maybe that's just my question. Is why why is really the beginning of philosophy a problem for Hegel unless he thinks his own logic is a kind of system which needs a foundation that coincides with uh, the founding of something like that? Okay. That, that just okay. Das äh, 
bezieht sich auf Hegels äh, Verständnis der Philosophie als System. This, the, the answer has to do with uh, or must refer to Hegel's understanding of philosophy as system, as systematic knowledge. Yeah. For he, für Hegel uh, is Philosophie notwendig, necessarily a system. And deswegen und deswegen uh, ist der Anfang uh, das, uh, der entscheidende Punkt. Sie können nicht ein System haben ohne den Anfang. Uh, Aristoteles sagt, wenn Sie den Anfang der Philosophie haben, dann haben Sie schon die Hälfte der Philosophie. Also stärker kann man es gar nicht ausdrücken. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, um, the idea of system in Hegel, as already also in Aristotle, um, implies that uh, the beginning is a problem that has to be resolved. Once you have the beginning uh, of philosophy, Aristotle says, not Hegel, you have already half of the philosophy. Um, yeah. Aber man But, kann nicht, wie in der Mathematik zum Beispiel oder Geometrie, man kann nicht mit Axiomen beginnen. Warum? Weil äh, Axiome von ihrer Definition her eben nicht begründet sind. Philosophie muss nach Hegel aber alles begründen. Sobald in Philosophie etwas auftaucht, was nicht legitimiert ist, dann ist die Philosophie äh, nicht äh, zu halten, nicht mm -hmm. zu legitimieren. So, uh, in philosophy, contrary to what is the case in mathematical systems, for example, uh, one cannot, according to Hegel, start with axioms, because axioms, by definition, cannot be grounded. Hence, they are not philosophically valid which is why the beginning is a true problem for philosophy, not necessarily for other specific sciences. Und einer der wichtigsten Versuche, dieses Problem zu lösen, das sieht auch Hegel so, ist die Philosophie von Fichte. Er wollte ein System als deduktives System aufbauen, der Philosophie mit einem äh, natürlich dann notwendigen Anfang. Mhm. Also das ist für Hegel ein Vorbild. Mhm. Nur, Hegel ist der Meinung, äh, und das hat Fichte selber eingeräumt, indem er 14 oder 15 verschiedene Wissenschaftslehren versucht hat, äh, er hat das Problem des Anfangs nicht mhm. zureichend gelöst. Mhm. Und das ist Hegels Versuch, mhm. über Fichte hinauszugehen. Mhm. Uh, one can see this uh, um, discussion on Hegel's part of the problem of the beginning as his attempt to um, overcome the difficulties in which Fichte had found himself, because the intention of Fichte was very similar to the intention of Hegel in the, in the logic, namely to deduce everything from a beginning. But um, as shown by the fact that Fichte wrote, what, 15, 16? 14, 15, yeah. Different Wissenschafts Lehren, <laughs> which nobody really reads, so not all of them. Um, uh, Aber das zeigt das Problem, das yeah. zeigt die Schwierigkeit. Yeah, Fichte yeah. Hat, hat das yeah. Problem erkannt. Yes, yes. Fichte, Muss man hervorheben und right. loben. Yeah. So good, Fichte did see the problem, but according to Hegel was not able, obviously, to resolve it. <laughs> As, But the, the model of philosophizing in a system um, is one that Hegel would um, take from Fichte and maybe others. And yeah. also uh, Spinoza is a, yeah. a good example. Yeah, Spinoza for, is for the such other example. Example. Also the example. Yeah. Not Kant and not Schelling. Mm -hmm. They have no system. Yes. Um, I have another like, basic question. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering what Hegel means by 
immediacy and mediation. And we did talk about that a lot. And the only way I understand it is through this, my association or associating this concept with cost and immediacy with intuition and mediation with some kind of concept. So I'm just wondering, but I'm, I think this is used in a different way in the book. So is there a DC version of like explaining what that exactly means for Hegel within this context of yeah. your work? Danke. Ein Beispiel für et etwas Unmittelbares, mhm. äh, das nennt man, äh, das ist auch in der äh, US-amerikanischen Philosophie bekannt, das ist der berühmte Myth of the Given. Das ist also etwas, was uns scheinbar gegeben ist, was vorhanden ist, also die Welt oder so, es ist gegeben. Das ist ein... Äh, äh, ein unmittelbares, ein Verständnis von Unmittelbarkeit, die Hegel ablehnt. Das ist natürlich Common Sense, dass die Welt irgendwie gegeben ist. No, das ist für Hegel inakzeptabel. So an example of uh, immediacy is what in uh, anglo -Mary... Sellers. Sorry? Sellers. The myth of the given, Sellers. Yes. yes. Ja. In what in Anglo-American philosophy is called the myth of the given. Uh, that is a kind of uh, immediacy that Hegel um, rejects in that it is too one-sided, basically. Oder äh, zum Beispiel äh, so eine äh, Fähigkeit, die wir äh, Glauben nennen. Mm -hmm. Oder äh, die philosophische Konzeption von angeborenen Ideen. Mm -hmm. Das ist alles etwas Unmittelbares. Das ist nicht in Relation zu uns, sondern das finden wir. Hegel nennt das das bloße Finden, aber das bloße Finden ist noch keine Legitimation. Other examples from philosophy of immediacy would be, for example, uh, innate ideas. That is contents of thought that are not somehow in relation to the thinker, but that are simply found by the thinker uh, immediately, as we also say. Und dagegen die Vermittlung vielleicht? Ja, äh, was äh, die Vermittlung ausmacht, ist eben das, äh, sehr vereinfacht gesagt, das ist das, was in Relation steht was zum Beispiel in Relation zu uns steht, ne? dass wir uns beziehen auf irgendein Ding oder auf irgendeinen Sachverhalt und ihn denken, verändern, wie auch immer. Und damit ist er vermittelt. Entweder durch uns oder äh, andere, äh, bleiben wir bei diesem einfachen Beispiel, durch uns vermittelt. Und damit ist die Unmittelbarkeit überwunden. Also alles ist in Beziehung zu etwas, alles ist vermittelt. Und das ist auch eine einseitige Position. Uh, by contrast, uh, something is mediated for Hegel uh, when it um, is in relation to We're talking here about theoretical philosophy, for example, in relation to the thinker, which has mediated this content through thinking it. And if I may add, just because of the specific question, the Hegel's idea of the unity or identity in the end of immediacy and mediation, which I suppose I could say means for him that immediacy and mediation are fake. They're not really anything that happens by itself. Is, for example, if you think or reflect about innate ideas. That's, that's you thinking that is mediating something that you think of as immediate. That's the two things yeah. happening together. Und eine andere äh, Form, eine andere Form dieses äh, Vermittelten äh, ist in der äh, Philosophie ja berühmt, das nennt man Erfahrung. Yes. 
Das ist Erfahrung, das ist die, der Standpunkt des Empirismus, das ist, dass wir Erfahrung machen und äh, das äh, hat die Struktur der Mittelbarkeit oder der Vermittlung, was natürlich in den unendlichen Progressus führt, ne? das nicht zur Wahrheit führt, diese, diese Position. Das wäre äh, eine Form der Kritik von Hegel an der Mittelbarkeit, der Vermittlung, mhm. denn die führt zu keiner Wahrheit, die führt... Äh, wie, äh, wie man im Deutschen sagt, ich weiß nicht, ob man das übersetzen kann, in den St. Nimmerleinstag. Das ist ein Tag, der nie, ko ein Tag, der nicht, nie kommen wird. Ja. Another example of, uh, uh, of uh, mere um, mediation would be the perhaps empirical or so concept of experience. Experience is something that connects perceptions or events one to the other, but uh, without end, essentially. That is, without um, without uh, arriving at a grasp of that experience. So Hegel hat ein schönes Beispiel. Das ist eine Lotterie ohne Ziehung. It's, uh, Hegel says uh, this kind of Conception of experience is like a lottery without seal. What? Without a draw. Yeah, a lottery without a draw. It goes on forever. <laughs> yes. So, what does fuel have to do with thinking? What does what have to do with thinking? Will, oh, oh, yeah, that's very yes. important. Uh, ich habe versucht schon zu antworten, dass yeah. das erste Prinzip oder mm -hmm. die erste Bestimmung mm -hmm. des Willens für Hegel ist Denken. Yeah. Hegel uh, überwindet diese Trennung uh, uh, zwischen Denken und Wollen in, dies, in diesem Fall. Das heißt für Hegel, gibt es keinen freien Willen, ohne dass ich gedacht habe, ohne Denken. Okay. Dann das ist Arbitrariness, das ist Willkür für Hegel, ohne das Denken. Und deswegen wird schon im ersten Schritt das Denken äh, eingebaut oder ist eine notwendige Bestimmung für den Willen. Das geht sogar noch weiter. Also, ich muss erst mal. Bitte. <lacht> um, for Hegel um the concept of a will has no sense unless it is connected to the concept of thinking perhaps to simplify somewhat what uh, professor folk said if i may is a creature that cannot think can also not will they are two sides of the same faculty let's say Uh, because a creature ca that cannot think may have arbitrary will, capriciousness, all sorts of other things, but not a will that is free. Okay? Das ist, is uh, that es, fair? Ja, ja. Okay. Es ist noch, äh, noch schwieriger, äh, wird es, wenn man Hegels äh, Logik anschaut, mm. dort wird schon der Begriff der Begriff wird schon als das Freie definiert. Und was heißt das? Das ist ein Sachverhalt der Selbstbestimmung. Und wenn ich von Selbstbestimmung rede, dann habe ich schon die, äh, das Fundament für Frei oder für Freiheit. Aber ich habe noch nicht in der Logik noch nicht den Willen. Aber ich habe schon äh, die Rede, äh, der Begriff ist das Freie. Er ist eine Form von Selbstbestimmung. Mm -hmm. In the logic, for example, where he does not yet speak of the will in any practical sense at all, uh, he, however, um, defines the concept, which is the one in, in, in English usually written with a capital C, because it's not just any concept, it is the concept, let's say mind, something like that, okay? He defines that as that which determines itself. 
because it determines its own content, which is what the logic is supposed to show. Okay, and so from the self-determining concept it, as a theoretical construct, if you will, okay, that then is for Hegel the basis for justifying his uh, practical concept of a will that wills itself or, or a will that consists in self-willing or self-determining, which is another word for freedom. So on. Yeah, I have two related questions, I think. So we said that at the beginning of science of logic, there are two movements of immediacy and mediation, and the movement of me me mediation comes from phenomenology of spirit, or has it has phenomenology of spirit as a presupposition? Does that mean phenomenology of spirit is part of the circle, or part of the um, system as a whole? If it's not, how can the circle presuppose something outside of it? My second question is, about the beginning of phenomenology itself, what comes before phenomenology of spirit as its presupposition or its mediating movement? Because if you're consistent with the that everything is both immediate and mediation, then we would have to expect from the beginning of phenomenology both movements. So what brings us as the mediating movement to phenomenology of spirit? Okay. Die äh, Phänomenologie des Geistes, das ist vielleicht eine provokative These von mir, äh, dient ausschließlich theoretisch der Legitimation des Anfangs der Philosophie. Okay, enough. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, his, uh, Professor Fiebeck said, well, this might be a provocative thesis of mine, though if I may, I have said that very often already. <laughs> in this, in this, uh, in these circles, uh, the phenomenology of spirit serves simply as a preparation for the beginning, or, or for establishing the beginning of philosophy proper. So yes, it's not part of philosophy. Yeah. Es ist ein aus meiner Sicht ein skeptisches Unternehmen. Hegel nennt das self-fulfilling skepticism, also sich mm -hmm. selbst vollbringender Skeptizismus, mm -hmm. dass alle anderen Formen, also innerhalb dieses Bewusstseins, äh, dieses Paradigma des Bewusstseins destruiert. Yes, it is basically the destructive part, the via negativa, is, as usually they used to say, to philosophy, meaning showing all the forms of consciousness that lead not to no knowledge and from that point of view it is preparatory purif purificatory maybe okay for doing philosophy from scratch almost okay that is es hat scheinbar die phänomenologie hat scheinbar ein äh, ganz äh, geringes Resultat oder ein Resultat, was scheinbar äh, äh, sehr wenig bringt, aber äh, für Hegel eben äh, entscheidend ist, nämlich am Schluss der Phänomenologie wird eine Form äh, vorgestellt, die immun ist gegen skeptische Einwände und das ist das reine Denken. Oh, yes. So I forgot also to mention that Hegel himself speaks of the phenomenology as of self-fulfilling skepticism. But the last chapter of the phenomenology, absolute knowing, is uh, um, a chapter about the only form of uh, spirit, if you will, in or mind in the phenomenology that is not uh, uh, not possibly subject to skepticism. Everything else is. Und zur, zum zweiten Teil der Frage, man könnte jetzt mit äh, Sextus Empiricus, das wird oft vergessen, oder äh, auch wenn Sie wollen, 
ausnahmsweise mit Wittgenstein der, die Position vertreten, dass man, wenn man die Leiter hochgestiegen ist, man die Leiter dann wegwerfen kann. Mhm. Das Bild stammt von Sexus Empiricus, mhm. nicht von Wittgenstein, wie uns analytische Philosophen gern einreden wollen. Und das ist auch Hegels Auffassung, sie müssen nicht die Phänomenologie durchlaufen, wenn, wenn sie sich entschließen, rein denken zu wollen. Okay. Dann brauchen sie die Phänomenologie nicht, aber die Leiter muss einmal hochgegangen worden sein. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, yeah, the talk of the self so Self-fulfilling skepticism, of course, goes back to Sextus Empiricus, who had this metaphor of skepticism as a sort of ladder that uh, the uh, people who were introduced to philosophy or induced into philosophy had to uh, scale. And, and then once they had arrived at the top, which would be the end of the phenomenology of spirit for Hegel, they would have to kick the ladder away and begin philosophizing. Uh, this is a metaphor that one finds also in Wittgenstein, but as Professor Fivik stresses, uh, it is not invented by Wittgenstein, but it is actually to be found in Sexus Empiricus. Und dieses zweite Moment, das wäre das Unmittelbare. Ich brauche nicht die, mm. äh, ich brauche nicht die mittelbare Begründung durch oh, yeah. die Phänomenologie. One could say that the preparation for doing philosophy that is offered in the phenomenology of spirit is a sort of mediation that one can do without in principle, thus beginning philosophy with the logic. Yeah. Uh, that would be then an immediate beginning as opposed to the mediated one. Das heißt zwei Wege, mm -hmm. aber der Beginn ist dann der gleiche. Auf yes. beiden Wegen einmal den mittelbaren Phänomenologie, Skeptizismus mm -hmm. und einmal Entschluss. Ich entschließe yeah, mich rein yeah. zu denken, unmittelbar. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there would be, it is possible to have two ways to beginning, to, to reach the beginning of philosophy. One is the phenomenolo phenomenological skeptical way and the other one is the Decision and fluss. Immediate, yeah. Yeah, the immediate decision to ignore everything else and to begin philosophy with thinking being. Sorry, what? Oh, there is a hand on the chair. I can't hear you. You can hear me now? Yeah. Okay, I'll. Um, Uh, okay, so I'll try to repeat what I was saying. Um, it has to do with the question, well, your 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 answer uh, just now, but in relationship to the previous question and an earlier one about the beginning and the and the circle. But it, and it has to do with essentially the justification of the beginning um, and this beginning in the phenomenology, so that the phenomenology it seems to purpose would be to exhaust or in terms of knowledge the structures to grasp all the structures in order to justify the beginning the beginning beginning which also justifies the beginning of science and the implication is that if one has not exhausted all the structures of, of consciousness in this case Then the be then the beginning would not be justified. Yes, I, ich stimme überein. Die äh, Rechtfertigung äh, in der Phänomenologie äh, läuft so, dass bestimmte Formen des Bewusstseins beginnen mit der einfachsten Form mm -hmm. eben äh, als defizient gezeigt werden. Also bestimmte epistemische Formen werden als defizient vorgeführt. Und sie können dann nicht als der logische Anfang der Philosophie gelten, weil sie in sich selbst defizient sind. Mhm. Nur das reine Denken nicht, laut Hegel. Yeah. 
So yes, uh, Professor Fiebig agrees with you. Uh, he stresses the point though that the forms of consciousness, or we should say of appearing consciousness, the phenomenological forms uh, in the phenomenology of spirit uh, are proven one after the other as being deficient in themselves, that is, as non -pro not providing knowledge. Uh, and therefore, they are, in Hegel's view, deficient with regards to philosophical knowledge understood as science. And so, while uh, das Bewusstsein von vornherein uh, dualistisch bestimmt ist, und zwar wie Hegel mit Reinhold sagt, dem Kantianer, dass sich immer ein Bewusstsein auf einen Gegenstand bezieht. Und damit hat man schon die Form der Relation. Man hat die Form des Dualist, der dualistischen Relation. Und Hegels Lösung ist dann vielleicht das kann nicht der, das Fundament von Philosophie sein, sondern nur die einzige Relation, die äh, immun ist gegen diese Einwände, ist die, äh, ist die Selbstbeziehung. Ja. Die Beziehung um, auf sich selbst. Ja. Das ist die, aller, äh, die einzige, die eben äh, keine Differenz und äh, keine Defizienz mehr hat. Right. So ja. the, the okay. reason mm -hmm. he adds for the deficiency of each and all the forms of appearing consciousness in the phenomenology is consciousness itself, because consciousness is by definition for Hegel, a relation to another, that is to an object. Uh, and uh, because of that, uh, there is already a duality um, baked into the very concept of consciousness Uh, which is, of course, the pivotal subject, if you will, of the phenomenology. And this duality does not, according to Hegel, allow us to begin in a pure, in a purely uh, or singly, maybe, uh, relation, which is thought thinking itself. So, so how, how could one then begin philosophy simply with the logic? I mean, even though it begins with the logic, but how could you skip the phenomenology in Hegel's, Hegel's phenomenology? Because you, you said that there could be two ways to reaching the beginning mm -hmm. of philosophy. He's, he's asking how, how does the other way work out? Right, Tony? Yeah, yeah. 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 Ich habe ja versucht zu sagen, es muss irgendwann durch irgendwen die Phänomenologie durchlaufen werden, damit die Legitimation okay. erfolgt ist. Aber wenn das geschehen ist, muss er oder sie das nicht unbedingt tun. Es ist zu empfehlen mit Hegel, damit man weiß, wie man das alte Paradigma überwindet. Or, or isn't it the case then, I mean, to follow up, that someone has to do this? Ja, ja, mm -hmm. ja, ja, jemand muss es getan haben. Der Weg, und Hegel hat es ja gemacht, mm -hmm. um den Anfang yeah. zu legitimieren. Ja, okay, okay. Und Jacobi das nicht getan haben. Und bei Fichte ist es misslungen. Also Hegels äh, ursprüngliche äh, Publikations- Absicht, aber vielleicht übersetzen Sie es. Sonst yeah. wird zu viel. So, uh, yes, uh, he agrees, uh, and indeed, as a matter of fact, this is why Hegel actually did write the phenomenology, namely as a leg legitimation yeah. uh, of uh, the beginning of philosophy yeah. with the logic. Ja, yeah. und Hegel hat in Jena begonnen, uh, ein Buch anzukündigen, 1802, Logik und Metaphysik. Das hat er nie realisiert, weil er dann äh, erkannte, dass das Problem des Anfangs nicht gelöst ist. Und deswegen musste er, also äh, er konnte sich nicht einfach auf den Standpunkt des reinen Denkens stellen oder sich entschließen, sondern er 
musste die Legitimation, die Rechtfertigung erst vornehmen. Aber das muss jetzt nicht jeder machen. Mhm. Wenn, jeder, wenn der Betreffende sich entschließt, reinzudenken, okay. Mhm. Mhm. So, just, just as an additional uh, point, Hegel did already Uh, five years before the publication of the phenomenology, attempt to write a system that he had already entitled uh, logic and metaphysics. But he uh, gave up on that specifically because he found himself unable to legitimize the way this would begin. And hence, he then dedicated himself to writing the phenomenology of spirit Uh, just because of the reasons that you, Tony, uh, indicated. Uh, okay, vielen Dank. Vielen <laughs> Dank. Um, I think that I don't want to cut off anybody, but you can continue to ask your questions or not uh, in the uh, other room where we have some uh, eat some dinner uh, for whoever wants to join us. But before we do that, I would like to really thank, thank Professor Fiebeck for his uh, contribution to our philosophical thinking here today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the discussion.